But before I welcome our guest um, for this evening, um, I'd just like to say a really big thank you to all the RS RSB members um, here today. Um, this is a members event and without our individual members and our member organisations, we couldn't do what we do. So a really big thank you to, to everyone. Um, but, you know, for sticking with us during those difficult times. Um, but also, I think a big thank you ought to go on record to the whole of the bioscience community for the, you know, the foundation work that they've done to allow the pandemic to be addressed in the way it is being addressed. And for those who are actively involved in rolling out the solution at this moment in time. So I think just an on the record thank you to everyone for the work that, that's been done on, on all our behalves. Um, we've tried to do our bit as well as an organisation and we've pulled together material. Um, it's available on the website, as many organisations have done, whether it's education material um, or discounted training courses, those sorts of things. Um, if you haven't received our policy newsletter every week, then you may want to sign up for that. But we've also pulled together a COVID bulletin, which tries to use original research sources to give a flavour of the current research on COVID. Um, it's been very popular, and if you don't get it, it's now coming out every month. Um, please uh, do consider signing up for that. Um, apart from the parliamentary work, we also do a lot of policy work as well. And with COP26 approaching, environment is very, very high on the agenda. Uh, with Brexit, you know, what the government will do in terms of environmental standards will remain very high. The whole of the science funding agenda post-Brexit and what we do. Um, and of course, education changes. And just today, we've had more announcements in England about A-levels and GCSEs. And the education policy team are doing a lot to respond to that. And we work collaboratively with Source Out of Chemistry, the Physics Associated of Science Educators and Royal Society to try and present a collective view on science education to, to government. And we'll be working with the Department of Education as they look at what they're going to be doing with, um, with A-levels and GCSEs. So that's just a bit of background on some of the things that are going on. Um, for tonight, uh, if you're on Twitter and you use social media, the hashtag we're using is RSB Engage Parliament. That's all one word, hashtag RSB Engage Parliament. Um, this is being videoed and it will be available on the RSB uh, YouTube channel a little bit um, later on. So that's uh, all the background for now. Um, in terms of questions, we've had quite a lot of um, questions submitted already. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll try our best to cover a selection. And during the course of the discussion, if you use the chat function, um, which is available on Zoom, we'll try and pull out some of those questions to fit them in um, with the discussion. And please do bear in mind that we're talking primarily about the select committee work rather than the government itself on, on this particular occasion. So um, I hope you enjoy this evening. At the end, there'll be a short survey, which we hope will we'll fill in. So it's a great pleasure to welcome this evening Catherine Fletcher, uh, MP from uh, Member of Parliament for Ribble South. Um, I'm looking at Catherine's CV, for those of you who have done that already, you'll notice that Catherine is a biology graduate from the University of Nottingham. She was uh, brought up and raised in Manchester. She's done a lot of uh, different things, including as a nursing assistant early in her career, working in construction. Um, she's run um, SMEs in the manufacturing sector, and she's done a lot of work in, in Africa. She's a qualified ranger. And again, from the CV, I see that she doesn't like honey badgers, and we'll find out why that's the case. Um, as we go on through uh, through this evening. Um, but uh, she's also the envoy um, for uh, Mozambique, uh, and um, she was elected first in 2019, so she's a relatively new, newcomer, and therefore is having her first experiences on a select committee, and perhaps one of the things you might explore this evening is what her impression has been of that select committee work. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Catherine. She's going to talk for five to ten minutes, and then we're going to have um, a Q&A session. So I hope you enjoy this evening, and I'll turn my video off now and come back on again in a moment. So Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And uh, hello, members. Thank you very much for having me. I feel very slightly like I'm going to be the least qualified person talking here as a mere BSc. Uh, graduate, but uh, fingers crossed we can get into some of the meatier stuff about Parliament and science and how it interacts. So um, let me give you a little bit of background. I can't ever remember not being fascinated by biology and the natural world, even through um, uh, ladybirds, you know, when they do the migration, when they've eaten everything on one tree. I went across four lanes of traffic once, it's about eight, to watch them all kind of crawl across the ground. You can imagine how popular that was. But that interest has kind of spawned into doing science A-levels and a straight biology degree at Nottingham. Um, the uh, 
it's it's a pleasure to talk to an audience where I can actually come out with this sentence. But my undergraduate was uh, transgenic C. elegans, using them as a bioassay tool for polluted river sediments and stuff. And whilst that ultimately, like many areas of research, didn't actually uh, result in a practical solution at the other end, it has resulted in quite a lot of friends, family, people in pubs not really understanding what I'm trying to say. So it's a delight to be able to use the words canarabditis in a conversation. In fact, at one point, um, I'm sure you've all experienced this. I was actually tapped on the shoulder by a friend when I was trying to explain what I was doing, who said, Catherine, just tell them you're doing something with worms. Deep levels of joy. So like many of us, I didn't stay in the research community. I went off to do IT and, and lots of other things since. But at some point, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to maybe go and see where we evolved in the African savanna environment and used my biology background to go and do a conversion course to be a field guide. It's not really a ranger, but um, you know, it has elements of it. And was living and working in Pumalanga and then Popo. Um, you know, I have, uh, as, as Mark referenced, a healthy fear of honey badgers um, who are the brightest and the best within the African environment, but also got to observe those little nuances that make life go round. So, for example, when the baboons were coming to steal, because it was an unfenced camp, and when the baboons were coming to steal the sugar pots, as a woman, I couldn't scare them off. We had to go and find the smallest and the quietest lad. And because of that, there's olfactory senses, which I assume were kicking in. The lads could scare the baboons off, but the women couldn't. And I thought that was the most interesting way of explaining the amount of things we've lost as this bipedal ape, as well as those that we came. Maybe we can refer back to that. So um, how do I end up in this position addressing you tonight? Well, back in 2013, you know, I'm a proud northerner. I basically I got all the party political manifestos and picked the one I disagreed with the least because I felt it was really important to have more northerners in parliament, more kind of practical um, women in parliament, more science background in parliament, you know, to get a breadth. Don't get me wrong, PP at Oxbridge is an important area of study and, I, and you know, and lots of the kind of English and history degrees, they'll certainly write a, a better article than I will as a dyslexic scientist in the press but I'm a huge believer that the, the biggest diversity that we can get in parliament leads to better decision making, better policy making and better internal challenge and I think it's something I'd like to refer back to. So I, too, I was fortunate enough to be uh, selected and elected by the good people of South Ribble which is just under Preston if anyone's not too sure of the geography and came into Parliament determined to join the Science and Technology Select Committee and use some of my background and interest to help inform policy making. And what a year. Um, so we have been at the forefront of a series of inquiries, heavily COVID dominated, and I'm sure we'll refer to that at some point. But we've also been looking at 5G. Um, we've been taking evidence about the creation of a UK style ARPA, DARPA, you know, however you want to refer to it, but a science superpower to drive us forward. And that was particularly interesting listening to some of the do's and don'ts coming from international colleagues that we'd reached out to. And that's perhaps a, a, a good way to launch into what the Science Technology Select Committee does. The chair, Greg Clark, is genuinely independent. It's a paid role. We are um, a mixed heritage committee, so um, from all the different parties. And what that leads to is a really interesting sense of, of collective interest and challenge. It's nowhere near as party political as I thought it might be. It really is about understanding what's going on and perhaps of relevance to you guys, the importance of hearing and taking evidence from relative experts in field, both within the UK, but also abroad and comparing and contrasting. So we will pick a specific topic. Let's um, commercial genomics is one that I came in towards the end of here a series of evidence sessions we will then draft and write a report which is broadly consensus based. Um, it is possible to, uh, to have alternative versions of the report, but there's quite a strong culture of mutual challenge so that reports are issued from the committee consensus base. And then that's often an opportunity to share views and engage with the leadership in Parliament. 
So I'm super delighted to be here. I'm not that keen on going on for ages. So Mark, um, if that's enough of an introduction of me and what I've been up to in the last year, perhaps we could go to the Q&A. What do you think? That's great. Thank you very much, Catherine. Hopefully I'm back on screen now. I can see myself. So. <laughs> It's not a pretty sight, never mind. Um, thank you very much for that. that that's re really interesting. And I mean, you took, you touched on things like the mixed heritage of the select committee. Um, and I'm just interested if I can sort of ask a, chair, a chair's question to start off with. Uh, as a biology graduate, I mean, do you think that um, we should have many more scientists in parliament? And, and if so, I mean, how do you encourage them uh, to join because I suppose the other side of the coin is that um, we've had some really very good science ministers over the years, David Sainsbury, David Willits, and Amanda Soloway, um, you know, who have, do not have science backgrounds. Um, and so I just wonder, you know, whether you buy into the idea that we do need more scientists, and if, if so, why and, and how we get them in. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm unashamedly of the opinion that we need masses more scientists in Parliament. I think um, if I quote the eminent and wonderful Kate Bingham, she was she was actually saying that, you know, it, what what does government need? And she said at Science Technology Committee, so you need more people with science, engineering and technology qualifications. And I think you, the, the way you were asking the question almost is, is part of my reasoning. So you can have wonderful science ministers, but if we're not careful, science just gets put in a box. You know, it's this technical boffiny thing that's done over there. Whereas actually for me, and I would hope the vast majority of the people here, it's a fundamental underpinning of good quality policy making in, in large chunks of areas. But outside of that, I think we are, either trained as scientists or are drawn to science because of the way we think. So that kind of very rational, like the way I describe it to layman is, you know, the cogs in the clock. You know, if you turn that cog there, then it turns that cog there, it turns that cog there. And I would observe that more of that kind of rational and logical production of not only the inputs and a stated goal, but how you turn the cogs to make sure that happens. I think your government more broadly can only benefit from that. And actually, maybe if we can get to it later, Mark, we get one of the challenges uh, I want to almost offer this community is why don't you get involved in this? I mean, I can't promise you glamour and riches, <laughs> um, far from it, in fact, but it is extremely, it's an extremely big opportunity to make quite a big difference. And I don't mean from an overtly party political perspective, you know, the science and technology, so you've got Carol Moynihan's, who's a physics graduate with the SNP. You've got Graham Stringer, who's a Labour chap from Manchester, therefore brilliant, um, who uh, is a biochemist by training, I think. You know, uh, how, do we, how do we put more of that mindset into parliament? Uh, so, and make sure that we are not only working out what we want an end goal to look like, but how we get there. That's before you get to uh, the importance of science to our economy, for innovation, for all of those things that I'm sure you, sure there are people nodding along to. That's great, yeah, thank you. I mean, you, took, you mentioned about consensus, and you, you said that I think you were looking at the party political manifestos and deciding which one you disagreed least with, which is quite an interesting way of, of approaching it. Um, rather than having a sort of heritage in one, one particular party. But I, it always strikes me there's an awful lot of consensus um, in the science community and politically. Um, is, is that really healthy um, or does it actually stifle a bit of challenge? Um, well, I, 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 it depends what you mean by consensus. You know, I think we will all say, um, having looked at a, having a rational view of the evidence, that climate change is occurring, for example. And I think... A, a, being able to read that evidence, understand it, and then um, look at strategies to mitigate it, uh, it, and then communicate that out with people that perhaps are slightly more sceptical because it's over such a long amplitude that it's understandable that people that aren't necessarily brilliant at reading reams of data and then projecting out into uh, kind of the real world in a few years time, you know, I think there's a role for that. In terms of challenge, well, COVID, I think COVID's shown up that you can offer challenge without a scientific background but you can and you can also internally challenge so who would have thought before this year that you know most men on the most men and women on the street will understand that sage is a advisory body that comes to a midpoint view which it then presents to policymakers 
and they've had the opportunity to see uh, you know professors from alternative surge give one view and cmo and and, and professor uh, and uh, Dr. Valence giving a giving a central view. The, you know the 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 opportunity for science to show that by challenge it evolves and understands things. I think has been well evidenced. So I'm not sure we're on consensus yet. <laughs> That's good. I mean, actually, it feeds into one of the questions which were were submitted um, before the event actually around the, the COVID nineteen pandemic and. Um, we were being asked, you know, do, do you think that the pandemic has genuinely increased public understanding of the value of biosciences, not just for health, but in terms of the social and economic value? Or do you think that that, that agenda actually is still quite, quite missing? Um, do I think it's increased? Uh, yes, I think uh, there are an awful lot of people in the world that now understand that they would be in a uh, in a, something of a deep pickle if it wasn't for. And I, I am a woman. I am a huge proponent of women in STEM, so I do have to name check Professor Sarah Gilbert, who um, has done something really quite remarkable. Um, uh, and I have written to tell her that before you think I'm saying on oh, this one first. Um, do I think that we I don't, do you know, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> what, I mean, what, what do you think the, the kind of different range parameters are? Oh, sorry, I've got your That's right, let's put my, my thing back on again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm a, I yeah, if you have to forgive me, I'm a scientist. I'm not really a communicator. I'm still quite new at this. And I, I find it's easy to just go. Ugh. No, no, that's fine. But I think, I mean, I'm just interested because you've got a background in the sort of SME sector as well. Um, and I wondered, you know, whether or not you, you felt that that sort of production and value to the economy, the sort of um, the, the biotech industries, uh, the diagnostic industries, all those sorts of things. I mean, there many, many, um, you know, whether they're the sorts of things that people still remain largely unaware of. Because I, mean, I think there's more to do, if I'm honest. I, I, I think a lot of people um, uh, see this very much as a medical triumph and don't are not necessarily connected. You know, if you just judge, judge my by inbox today, the surprise and delight that the fill and finish with the vaccines being done in a factory in Wrexham. I think there was some expectation that this was something other and occurred elsewhere. So I think there's plenty more to do from a very solid basis to really push forward because the UK has got one of the most amazing kind of biosciences backgrounds, not only in research, but you know, in, a, in the series of allied industries and startups and, um, you know, the, our basic areas of lab space. I've been around both as a northerner, you'll expect me to say this, but I've been around Daresbury, I've been around the AstraZeneca site at Alderley Edge. I've even seen what's going on at Thornton in the old Shell site, They're all kind of allied SME startups. And I think there's much more we can do to push that. I think we're in, we're in a good place. I think the ground has been effectively tilled, but as biologists and as business people, we need to make sure that this is not seen as a medical triumph, even though it is in many respects for the NHS. Yeah, OK, thanks. That's, that, thanks very much. And we probably should turn to some of the questions. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in now li live on the chat. Um, and, and one which links into the early discussion, a little bit, I suppose, is from David Lewis. He's, he's asking, you know, how much influence do you really think select committees actually have on government policy? That's interesting. I... I would say B, B plus in the, <laughs> ulti in, in, in the ultimately, uh, you know, the, the decisions are made by government, but, but the best of government is listening to people that have a set of expertise that is perhaps over and above or separate to the civil servants within any given department. Um, so the 5G one uh, was one where, which was of particular interest where I would say, the government um, uh, kind of evidence gathering machine and policy generating machine was probably ahead of where, you know, lots of the inquiries that we were taking. Whereas flipped it round for COVID, we, I'm not allowed to tell you the details of it because it's parliamentary convention, but we had a private select committee meetings way, way back at the end of March. And some of the material that was presented in there I'm not even sure, not, I, I, I'll be careful seeing as this is going on YouTube, but the names of the professors that attend would be entirely familiar to everybody here today. That definitely did influence government policy. So I think it's probably about the pace of how much it moves. What I would observe is, um, especially now, and I can only talk to the last year, which is in my direct experience, that 
the, sign, uh, the, the select committees are reached out to by other colleagues for both opinion forming and policy engagement. So members of the Science and Technology Committee have been asked. Similarly, Robert Halfen, who's a name that will be familiar to many of you, is asked for his expertise in the education arena by both colleagues that influence policy and by ministers within government. So I would say yes, but th let's not pretend that we are actually in charge of the policy, it's advisory. You're on mute. I'm going to make a fortune in the next few years. I'm yeah. going to get a t-shirt that says well you're done. on mute. <laughs> Um, there's a, a point follows on from that, I suppose, from um, from Professor Nigel Brown, who's, who's asking, you know, do you think that the, the current COVID uh, inquiry has to be all retrospective or can it can it have a role in influencing current policy and in particular things like the debate around dosage and the gaps between it? Um, it can it have an influence here and now? Is it always going to be retrospective? Um, well, I think I've just kind of touched on the fact that in this particular set of circumstances, it is it is it is um, pre policy making, um, and I'd also refer to the ARPA DARPA inquiry. Um, you know, do we want an advanced research? That's well in advance of the policy being developed. So actually, the material and the evidence that we heard, especially from the chaps in the American um, setup, I know has gone straight in to help form that policy. Um, in terms of COVID, I think it's a real mix. So one of the focuses that we've been, I mean, it's been busy. We've been doing one or two a week for ages. I mean, we did our last one on the 23rd, examining the new variant in Kent and trying to understand the implications for that. And what's been really important is to gather people's views points at a point in time, because I think far too many of these reports are done with the benefit of hindsight in the rear view mirror. And as much as you can, let's get in advance of policy making. But if there is somebody taking really big and important decisions, let's make sure that we catch it live and don't engage in either a hagiography or something even, you know, something even worse. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, Liz Marchant has asked you, do you think that um, the public actually have come to understand how science works any better? As a result of this, because I suppose you know we see uh, people like Patrick Balance and Chris Whitty getting up and talking about things that have happened, and of course the data changes and informs the policy, and the policy changes. Um, and I guess there's criticism that that leads to a, a lack of trust or misunderstanding of how science works. Do you think that's true, or do you, or do you think that the public is starting to understand that a bit better? Um, I, I want to pay tribute to them and Jonathan Van Tam and Jenny Harris. I think what they've done, sorry, Dr. Harris, what they've done is um is is really made science accessible for people um, and what i find and i can only speak to my personal experience but actually the 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 commentary and some of the criticism that's in public from sections of the press is it seems to be bypassing um you know the people that write to me or the people that i bump into in tesco's or Lidl or whatever um they are taking a very scientific intuitive understanding of these things and whilst the acceptor is a job to criticize and challenge and all of that the job of communication that those guys are doing has really penetrated the public in my opinion but i would be interested in whether you think that's the case uh, you know as as better qualified professionals than me yeah i think from from everything we, we see there's a sense that there's a better public understanding but there's always that sort of backstory about whether or not it's working as well as it could be. I mean, I, I certainly agree. I think they've done a fantastic job in, in helping the public understand. And I think, you know, the community by and large would, would say exactly the same as that. Um, but, you know, there are there's, there's still the opportunity, I think, for data to be misunderstood. And if we go forward, you know, there's bound to be an incident where there's a, a bad reaction or, you know, dare I say, even death as a result of vaccination. Yeah, it'll be a you know one out of a million or more people maybe, and that, those are the sorts of things where you know it's going to be really important to communicate why those sorts of things have happened. So yeah, I think I agree they're doing a great job, but I think we just have to be perhaps a little bit careful about that going forward. Yeah, I think that's been one of the most challenging things, and observed it in colleagues. There is a, there is a little bit of a divide between people who, whether they've been in business, whether they've been in economics, whether they've been in science, but are used to having a sheet of paper with numbers on it and kind of translating it in their head to what does this look like in the real world versus people that are perhaps more steeped in, you know, essay orientated subjects. 
The only thing that I would offer in the case for positivity is the vast majority of people in in kind of um, you know working communities that have been affected by this pandemic and paying attention to the science are working in businesses or so there I, I would argue that they're more numerate and are more likely to hear the scientific messages and understand the difference between one in a million and one in 10,000 um, but with there's more we can do so that killer fact that came out yesterday where one in 50 people is on a pot is testing positive translate that to two percent of the population is currently COVID-19 positive boy that's rung a bell so you know think the two together the ground is proven and you know we need to just keep making sure that we can find a decent analogy i was gifted a t-shirt at christmas of, of uh, professor jonathan van tam um you know it, yeah, I you know where you've made it if you're on a t-shirt <laughs> i understand the, the chris witty mugs are doing really well as well yeah <laughs> um thanks very much Kathy. um perhaps we can sort of move the conversation on to a, a slightly different area and there's quite an interesting question i've just seen come up from and James Williams, who's asking, you know, the other way round, you know, we talked about the need for more science in, in Parliament. Uh, as a scientist yourself, um, you know, did you do much in the way of picking up you know, philosophy, history, other non-science subjects in, in, in your own study? And do you think it's important that, that scientists themselves actually have, need to have a broad education? Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, I will confess to not engaging in those topics through formal education but if you put BBC documentary into YouTube it's remarkable what you can unearth and I think what we need to be doing is making that kind of um, self-education makes it sound a bit fancy but if you're if you're interested in the world and want to go and understand what a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy is doing or what the um, the interregnum during the civil war means for political environments or um, what a very young looking John Whittingdale thought of working for Margaret Thatcher you know you can access all of those things and should do to be a decent parliamentarian in my opinion and I've tried very hard to do it um, I think there is a question of accessibility so I I'm from uh, where they film the opening titles are shameless just the, about a mile up the road um, and I want those kids to be able to access the stuff we're talking about. So let's not leave it all to YouTube. I'm, I particularly want to thank the BBC for opening up some of their archive during COVID. You know, let's make sure that it's not just the via expensive books and expensive courses that you can access a, a broader education. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. But do you, as a as someone who's worked in the SME sector and, and now sat on the select committee, I mean, do you find that there's still a heavy bias towards hearing from the academic community rather than, than from the private sector, or do you think that that, that situation has improved over recent years? A, a bias, I'm sorry, you just slightly broke up. A bias from the academic community versus the private sector on what topic? Yeah, just in terms of evidence coming forward to the select committees and the way in which government policy is influenced. Do you, do you ah. But the yes, the community is overly represented and the private sector underrepresented or, or not? Yes, I, I think so. And I, I've um, uh, and as during the course of our inquiries, I've pushed quite back, back quite hard. So, for example, when we were doing the advanced research projects inquiry, we were hearing an awful lot from the kind of academic establishment. And I really and I really wanted to hear from uh, people, you know, maybe even only at the PhD studies level to understand what the new generations wanted. Um, and the other thing I think we find we find it difficult to do is access extremely busy SMEs. So if you've just gone, if you've just got 20 grand worth of uh, startup capital and you, you know, you're one man banding it in a communal lab, it's quite hard for us to understand what you need to support you as you expand outside of the very generic things that would be true if you were selling trainers or software or something else. So I would be I would either online or offline welcome if anyone wants to write to me with suggestions about how we can access those communities better. My you know, I'd like to just run a survey or something. But again, that's, a, you know, it's it's easily said and it's hard to set up and have some flexibility within it. OK, that's great. And I I'm sure there will be people in the community who would like to help you with that. So I guess anyone on, on, online today, please, please do get in contact with Kathy after this. Um, and I guess that leads into um, a sense of the skills requirements which might be needed going forward. And um, Dr. Ruth Brown Shepherd has asked a question about you know, the impact that the current pandemic might have uh, through cancelling GCSEs and A levels and the skills gaps. 
particularly in the private sector um, going forward. And that perhaps brings me on to the topic of, of joint working, because you've done something quite innovative as the Select Committee for Science and Technology and working um, alongside Health and Social Care, the Select Committee, for your COVID inquiry. And we've seen um, in the science infrastructure in the UK, UKRI bringing together uh, the different um, subsections of the science, social science economic community to try and do more integrated work. And I guess that work of your select committee reflects that a little bit. Um, do you see more of that type of inquiry happening where you work in partnership with another select committee, for example, on the skills gap, where you might work with, with education or perhaps with COP26 coming up? Um, looking at the environmental selection issue. Uh, yeah, in short, yes. Um, I mean, the um, it, the health and social care and uh, uh, select committee joint working around COVID was to some extent a little bit of us taking our own evidence. So one of the things that was really clear about the uh, in the advanced research projects evidence that we heard from abroad was the idea of getting out of silos and how um, and how the traditional uh, kind of mastheads of biology, chemistry, physics, IT are all just starting to work together. Um, you know, I, when I was gene editing to put heat shot proteins in or more technically watching somebody else do it, uh, you know, the calculations were not done on a computer because I am... Mm. Uh, you're all astonished that, that she was never there in the late 90s, but I'm university. But do you see what I'm getting at? Okay. Um, and I think that uh, agile development for any set of STEM subjects is not about running into silos. Now, it's not always possible within the parliamentary party to engage like that. But I, I would also, um, uh, I think the APPGs, so the all party parliamentary groups are a really useful vehicle to do that because in many respects you can set an a there are thousands of them and you can set one up to do anything so if you wanted to do epidemiological modeling within an nhs data set to transform different treatment options you know is if there's something there that needs cross-party working um and access to uh, the health and the science and technology select committee um you know as well as never mind stuff that's within bays to get the startups working then an appg is a great vehicle for a specific environment as well um I, I, again you know the par parliament parliament's website's got some really interesting ideas on it but i think some of the most powerful things come out of appgs as feed-ins to the select committees thank you yeah and of course the parliamentary scientific um uh, parliamentary uh, committee is I think now the old, well, it is the oldest of the parliamentary agencies do. Um, and I know they appreciate a shout out because they get involved in their work if, if you don't get involved. So I'll, I'll do that now. They do great stuff at the parliament regularly. Um, on the private sector agenda, um, I see we've got a question from Dr. Jason Harper, a union leader, who's, who's just asking, you know, uh, what's the best way to um, input into the work of the Science Story Select Committee in terms of which topics they pick? I mean, how how does the Select Committee go about choosing the work programme each year? Well, um, uh, the, the definitive answer to that is slightly above my pay grade. You have to remember that I'm relatively <laughs> new. Um, but typically there is a long list developed and it will be things that are topical. Um, there is a long list developed, which is then put to a discussion within the committee members for what relative priorities are. And we're typically going from kind of 10 to 3. Um, so you, uh, I think this is public now, but we know we've discussed that our next investigation in science and tech will be hydrogen and that, you know, it's, you know, it's of, of particular interest and crosses over. Um, in but it is generally within the chair and the clerk's discretion to get the long list. But the best way to do it, if you've got something specific in mind, is, is, about, um, is about making sure that it's relevant and open to the public and is a, is a, a topic of discussion already like cop 26 that's why that's so important because it, it will give the background to springboard an awful lot of things yeah no i'm sure I, yeah that's right. okay um, i mean i think that um uh in terms of the way the section happened in the past there's been some interesting um, new approaches asking people to submit short you know two or three minute presentations very short papers and that sort of thing to select things so um i think <coughs> the select committee itself has changed a little bit which is quite, quite encouraging. Um, 
One of the questions from James Crabb is, you know, do you think that do you think that the Select Committee does enough to take account of international comparisons? And you know, do you do you take evidence from um, international groups? And I know from my time in the Foreign Office that we used to get um, you know Science Review Select Committees and other select committees come out to the MDC and do uh, research work. Now at the moment that clearly isn't mm -hmm. possible. So I suppose the answer in, 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 is that, that definitely does happen. But have you seen much of that in your role so far? I mean, you haven't had much of a chance to do it, I appreciate that. Um, in terms of physically uh, re removing my derriere to foreign climes, regrettably <laughs> not. Um, you know, so I'm very much looking back, looking forward to being able to go and uh, be the Prime Minister's trade envoy in Mozambique, as you mentioned in your introduction and getting out there. But actually, I would argue, like many things with the pandemic, that actually our ability to access international experts is increased. So I cannot think of a, an inquiry that we've run where we haven't taken international evidence um, uh, and literally from around the world. We've heard from experts in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in South Korea, in America, in Germany, in France with COVID. Um, we heard from experts in America, France, and can't remember, apologies, for the ARPA investigation. And actually, as popping onto these Zoom calls, it becomes more conventional and our ability within Parliament to listen to people as, um, and the technological capabilities there, I actually think it expands our base. So uh, to answer your question directly, I've not had an inquiry where we haven't actually really focused on international comparators. That's not to say that we automatically assume that everything that happens overseas is, is gilded and therefore perfect, but it's, it's, it's much easier to do and very powerful. Yeah, thank you very much. I guess, I guess you know, this is it's such an instant world now that we can do a lot more because we're in, interacting with, you know, the global community all the time. Um, and there's quite a few questions I see coming in about, you know, rebuffing um, poor, poor science and, um, you know, uh, conspiracy theories, particularly around things like vaccination and COVID and that sort of thing. Do you, do you see the Select Committee being able to do more on that or actually is that not really something for you? Um, I think what we can do is showcase the best of British scientific community in a longer format, because the thing the thing with anything like that is that it looks fantastic in one sentence that your mate sent you on Facebook. Oh, you've frozen a little bit there. Oh, oh dear, what a pity, never mind. Um, uh, can you, have I come I back? Can hear you, I can hear you now. Fabulous. Back, what we yeah. need is a northern powerhouse for the digital economy. And I think one of the things that really is important is digital. <laughs> um, so the Viva broadband rollout. Have I have I reappeared in whole and massive form? Uh, I can certainly see you now. So I hope Brilliant. You um, uh, so uh, where were we? Sorry, I've completely lost the thread now. <laughs> so, so have I actually. <laughs> um, should we... Um, Sorry, yeah, should we, should that, that, that took me a bit. Should we just um, come back to a couple of um, final points? Because I noticed we're, we're, we're almost um, out of time. Um, and um, I, I suppose that comes back to the Select Committee itself. And um, I, I'm just quite interested, and it's something which others have asked me from time to time. Do you, do you get surprised by what you hear at Select Committees? Or is it actually something which you know, by and large, you expect. I mean, do you, not so much as an individual, but do you think as a policy, as policy makers, that the community learns a lot from the work that goes on? Because as an organisation, the RSB and also many others spend a lot of time writing consultation responses, and we obviously want to make sure that they're worthwhile. Um, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask because I already have a reputation for being the nerd in chief on the <laughs> Science Technology Select Committee. So I'm, uh, I'm interested, I've likely encountered it at a very surface level in the past. So having a, have a, a springboard to get into some of the detail that relevant to policy making. What I can say is there are a number of colleagues on the committee that maybe come from business or science or legal backgrounds, and they are surprised by what gets said, and they go and talk to colleagues, and therefore there is a positive influence on the body politic by people going, you'll never guess what happened the other day. <laughs> Whereas I'm slightly too, I'm conscious of being a, of, of kind of wandering around not giving people a uh, you know that oh isn't this was completely fascinating kind of commentary which is perhaps slightly arcane to individuals but the short version is uh, we need more not less engagement but 
I have I have been struck by how how few of my colleagues have even got kind of GCSE level science qualifications. So for us to advocate and engage, it's got to start simple to take people through it. Um, it's really interesting. You won't you you all have busy lives, so you won't have seen it. But I was asking about deletions versus insertions versus changes on the mutation on the genome for the new Kent variant, because obviously with the knock on effects on the codons. And I did that with a slightly silly kind of here's a Christmas tree and the amount of colleagues going, oh, didn't get that. Right. OK, so if 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 what it requires is for somebody to look vaguely silly and doing things like here's a spike protein, I actually don't mind doing it. But if I could encourage all colleagues to make sure that the first page is GCSE and then you'll take your audience with you. And I, 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 I appreciate that that sounds a, a teeny bit ridiculous, but when, you've, when you're on a train and you've got four hours reading, if you can't understand the first three paragraphs, you're just not gonna play. So um, step back to step forward if possible. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure that's really good advice actually, thank you. And um, as we are almost out of time, just one perhaps slightly cheeky question at the end, which is that, um, uh, we used to have a life sciences minister, George Freeman, uh, was in that role. Do you think we should have one back again? Do you fancy the role? <laughs> well, not touching that with a barge pole. Um, let me tell you, um, I, you're never going to get me arguing that we should have less people dedicated to the sciences. Um, you know, uh, regardless of where your vote was within, within the Brexit word, if I dare say it, we are now uh, we are now set upon a path to be a truly global Britain, which is why I'm proud to be a trade envoy. And anything that helps us become a powerhouse in science, tech, um, engineering, maths, all of it, I, you know, I will always say yes to. Um, but uh, perhaps we could close with me saying, look at my fossils. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's about the only time in my entire parliamentary career I'll be able to say, do you like the fact that I've got fossils on my wall? That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, is there, first before we close, Cathy, is there anything else you want to do for you? Uh, no, no. I, I man I've managed to get my 500 million year old trilobites in. I'm happy. That's fantastic. That's great news. Thank you for your time. No, thank you very, very much. Because I know there's lots going on at Parliament. You know, lots of votes taking place, which are important to all of us. So. Thank you very much for spending the time um, to come and join us um, and do stay in touch. If there's anything, of course, um, the RSB can do or indeed our colleagues across the bioscience community, you know, just let us know. We'd be more than happy um, to help and support in any way we can. And, and ditto, um, I meant it. If people want to get in touch directly, I can't promise a quick response at the moment, but I would be interested to hear from all of you to help do what I can. Thank you very much indeed. And. Um, at the end of this um, meeting now, which I've finished, you'll see a link to a survey coming up in a moment. If you could do that and just let us know uh, your feedback and things we could do differently or, or not differently in the future, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you very much. As I said, this is the first of a series of, of events we're planning. We've got Mark Logan, um, hoping that he will join us in, in February sometime. And Carol Monahan is also going to join us as well. So we've got some other discussions with select committee members come up. Do watch this space. Um, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a, a very nice evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Bye-bye.